Um, I'm here from the United States. I live in Logan, Utah, which is a small town uh, in, in the north, north area of the state. Very beautiful, very rural. The uh, business started out, High Clone started out in, in uh, northern Utah because it was an agricultural area, a lot of cows, and they, their first, um, I don't have a, a, a clicker. Oh, I'll just use, okay, great. Um, uh, it's a beautiful little town up in the, in the mountains of Utah. Uh, it's kind of odd that we're there as a, as a uh, part of GE Healthcare, a very uh, high-tech uh, uh, facility producing um, uh, raw materials for bioproduction. Bio uh, it started out, as I said, as, a, as an abattoir area uh, for serum and now for chemically defined uh, media and, um, and buffers. So uh, we were kind of out of the way. It's very beautiful. It's difficult to get to the airport and uh, it's difficult to ship out of. But uh, so we suffer, we suffer through the, the remoteness and we enjoy the beauty of it. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, continuous manufacturing as an introduction and um, some of the uh, drivers for moving towards continuous manufacturing in biopharmaceuticals and then a couple of case studies. So continuous manufacturing um, is a, uh, is the current way most things are made, uh, petroleum products, Food products, uh, even steel and glass, are for the most part made in continuous manufacturing. And this is where raw materials come in one side of the plant, they're processed in a continual basis, and proceed out the other side and are trucked or shipped or, or railed away. Um, you can think about some of the maybe public television programs you've seen with continuous ovens. So you see batter being produced continually biscuits being stamped out onto a conveyor belt and, and going through a continuous oven and then boxed up at the other end of the plant. Uh, there's been a drive worldwide to apply this to pharmaceutical manufacturing. Most pharmaceutical manufacturing currently occurs in batch, including biopharmaceuticals. Uh, there's a growing move to, make, to turn this to continuous. Uh, there are many advantages to this, uh, but uh, the EMA and FDA are encouraging it, and we see uh, we see its development in small molecules, and we even now see it developing in biopharmaceuticals. There are many reasons why I've got a couple of talks on continuous manufacturing and the status of, of um, biopharmaceuticals in continuous manufacturing. We don't have time to go into it today, but uh, they fall into these pots of general quality, cost, speed. Uh, one of the general uh, values is that you can use sometimes the exact same equipment that you're going to use in manufacturing in process development. Uh, it's because the volume and the scale of the equipment itself is smaller because it runs 24 hours a day uh, and your total mass is accumulated uh, over a greater period of time. So the actual container volume could be much smaller. Um, often uh, because of many factors in biopharmaceuticals such as the increased specific productivity, products that required a 20,000 liter tank or many, a suite of many 20,000 liter tanks uh, can now be produced in a 200 liter continuous bioreactor. So from 20,000 liters to a 200 liter reactor uh, operating 24 hours a day it gives you the same mass. Uh, and we don't have time today to go through all the other advantages that, uh, that continuous manufacturing can give, but you can imagine some of them, one being the low residence time of the uh, entity in the reactor. Uh, moving from 14 days to about 24 hours uh, gives you a quality advantage there. Um, there are many uh, new, new developments that are allowing continuous manufacturing to occur. Uh, Single-use technology is, a, is an enabler of, of continuous manufacturing in biopharmaceuticals. Uh, advances in process control uh, derived from advances in process understanding is another uh, area that's driving the capability of, of operating in continuous manufacturing. Um, new developments in facility design that, that uh, accommodate and support uh, the flexibility and the, uh, the ease of, of setting up a continuous uh, perfusion type reactor um, drive it. And we don't have time to go into all of the technological advances that are supporting the recent developments in, for example, perfusion culture upstream that drive 
uh, continuous manufacturing. So what I'm going to talk about today, though, is um, perfusion media that's enabling the more efficient, uh, in what we call intensified uh, batch and intensified perfusion culture. People use perfusion both to build up and beef up the, the cell density and titer uh, yield in a batch reactor, as well as use perfusion to uh, support continuous manufacturing. On this slide here, um, I think the most important point it would, is from the graph looking at if you plot cell-specific perfusion rate, that's the exchange through the reactor based on the number of cells in the reactor, if you plot that against the uh, reactor volume perfusion rate, uh, you'll see that uh, we plotted here three different uh, concentrations of cells. As the cell concentration goes up, the, um, the, the amount of material that goes through the reactor gets uh, increases. So at, if, you, if the cells require a lot of media, uh, then you can, you can only operate at a low uh, cell density. But down here, you can see if you, if you don't require too much media per cell, if, you, if the cells are, are operating very efficiently in the media, then you can keep your, your reactor perfusion rate down in the area that you like to operate in, which is less than maybe three, um, uh, less than three uh, reactor volumes per day. So what we're, we're trying to do in optimizing the media is have the cells grow very, very well in a, uh, in a lower exchange, a lower rate of exchange of media. So here's uh, one approach to uh, we've taken in trying to optimize media that way. Here we've used our Actichol platform, which is uh, a chemically defined uh, serum-free media. And what are the names of the products are Feed A and Feed B but actually uh, we're using them here as supplements to the base media in both, uh, both approaches we've taken today. So they're not feeds to a batch culture, but they're supplements to the base media to beef it up for perfusion uh, applications. We're working in our ready-to-process Wave 25 system, which is a 25-liter a uh, capacity uh, Wave uh, perfusion bioreactor with the 2-liter um, perfusion bag and um, a uh, proprietary MAB producing line as a model. So we're going to approach uh, this two different ways. First of all, optimizing the media and uh, using a little design of experiment work to beef up the media for perfusion um, use in a batch approach. So we're using batch techniques to beef it up for ultimately for verification and perfusion. And uh, then a steady state approach where we're actually using perfusion culture to design the media. So first, looking at the batch approach, uh, uh, through optimization, we end up, uh, just let me put it this way, we can see the difference in the, the peak cell density uh, in the um, uh, formulation that was ultimately 75% of the original at 10% of one feed and 1% of another. And this is uh, looking at uh, uh, some contour plots for viable cell density and titer looking at uh, one of the feeds against the medium dilution here and uh, the other fe a feed against the other feed here, uh, picking out the sweet spots for each um, uh, concentration and coming up with our final formulation to verify in perfusion culture. So this is the result then of, of taking that media and running it at one reactor volume per day, perfusing this, uh, this uh, two liter reactor bag at one reactor volume per day and letting it go. So it's being controlled for the volume of media exchange, but we're not um, pulling out, harvesting any cells, we're not controlling any other parameter, letting it go. Uh, so you can see here, it, we reach an equilibrium of, of, uh, of cell specific productivity um, and uh, on about day eight, the uh, exchanging at one reactor volume per day, the, the uh, culture starts to crash because the, uh, we're exchanging at a constant rate and the cells are doubling every day. And this is just to find out what the maximum here, it's about uh, 65 million cells per mil. That's the limit of the other parameters in the uh, reactor. Uh, but that tells us where we can possibly control to. And this is the same data here. This is the uh, cell culture uh, viable cells. These are viable cells in this graph looking at some other parameters 
that we don't have to go into now, but uh, we certainly measure other things like um, uh, cell viability, uh, buildup of lactate and uh, ammonia and things like that to see the condition of the reactor. Um, but from this, we can then determine where we want to control the cell density. We don't want to be operating here where the, where the culture is dying. We want to start harvesting cells and keep the cell density uh, when they're in the late log phase. So around 50 million cells per mil would be maximum in uh, this situation. So this then is the result of holding the conditions at 40 million viable cells per mil and one reactor volume per day. Those are two uh, set points for the reactor. One is one reactor volume of uh, media per day. The other is setting it, harvesting cells and keeping the reactor at 40 million uh, viable cells per day. Now, both of these could vary. This is the one experiment uh, showing the possibility of operating at 40 million viable cells per mil, which is very high. Uh, this is a, 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 the, typical of the type of results people get in early perfusion work. Now, some people are operating at as high as 100 million uh, viable cells per day in regular perfusion bioreactor uh, manufacturing. Um, for those of you that are in the field, you'll know that's a very high density. It's an extremely high density, but it, it is possible, and people are using particular perfusion setups to operate at 100 million viable cells per day. People even reported achieving 200 million viable cells. 200 million viable cells per mil uh, in a, with a uh, recombinant uh, line that's producing um, uh, products such as monoclonal antibody. Now that is on the verge of crash, and it's not, the, uh, it's not a situation that's robust enough at all to operate in, but you can see if you can achieve 200 million, that 100 million it's possible to operate at. Although uh, there are many things to keep in mind when you're examining uh, systems this way. One is uh, it's nice to talk about viable uh, cells per mil. That's one parameter of, of uh, the situation. But for the most part, when you're operating at these high densities, 40 to 100 million cells per mil, the cell size is, uh, is reduced. Because of the conditions of the reactor, uh, we find that the mass per cell is significantly reduced, sometimes as much as uh, of 70%, so they're much smaller. So that's another consideration in monitoring or measuring or, or determining your um, activity, your yield, your specific activity, your production rate. So anyway, so this is a confirming run. Remember, we uh, let it go uh, uncontrolled before to see what it would do, and then um, based on that run, uh, held it at 40 million viable cells per mil, and um, we see that the uh, specific productivity held even, and this is over a period of one week, just giving the idea that uh, this is an approachable um, uh, condition. So now we're working with the exact same uh, reactor, exact same media, but we're using a steady state approach. Rather than optimizing it in a batch with a design of experiment approach, we're now going to op optimize it using a, um, a perfusion approach and here we've plotted the cell-specific perfusion rate against days. We start out at, um, uh, a, cell, at a high uh, cell-specific perfusion rate for a few days, turn it down, sample it, I'm sorry, the black arrow is a sample, turn it down, operate for a few more days, turn it down, operate for a few more days. So we're going to see what happens to the culture um, as we turn down the... Um, uh, 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 rate of, of media exchange, um, and we'll see what happens to the media. We'll see what the limiting factors are in the culture. One thing you see when you do this, uh, as you'd expect, the cell-specific perfusion rate here, uh, as, you, as, you, um, as you turn up the, um, or as you measure the, the yield in picograms per cell per day, as you turn up the cell-specific perfusion rate, you get more and more product being produced up to a, a certain point, and then other factors such as mass transfer can come into play. Plotted out here, we look at, um, there's two colors. One is the values be between 20 and 30 percent of the initial media concentration, and the other is below 20 percent. This is arbitrarily taken as a relatively desirable um, situation. That is, that below 20 percent of the initial concentration of a primary metabolite, we we'd want to avoid, and between 20 and 30 percent would be an acceptable uh, range of, of a primary metabolite. And here's some of the typical uh, amino acids we'd look at. 
uh, and where they exist in the uh, supplements. And uh, so then here's our color code showing that, that in fact, uh, as the cell-specific perfusion rate is turned down over time, we incrementally turn the cell-specific perfusion rate down, we see, for example, a starvation of serine. Now, why it would come back up here and why it varies from, um, from low to high to low uh, is another interesting thing that has to be uh, discussed that we don't have time today, but it's not as linear and it's not as uh, easy as, as many chemical reactions because they're cells, and in fact, we have um, pathways being turned on and turned off as uh, starvation occurs making it more complicated and more difficult to uh, formulate the media, but uh, that's what we do. Uh, here's another example of what happens as you, uh, as the cell-specific perfusion rate goes up, um, the um, percent of original concentration in the media here of asparagine obviously follows. And we can monitor it and see how long it will it'll follow that path and, and how uh, comfortable we are with, um, with our adjustment of the total cell mass in the reactor, the perfusion rate, and the amount of, of, a, of a primary metabolite in the uh, original formulation. So the conclusion on uh, approaching it with the um, steady state approach was to use 100% actichol with 7% of, of the feed A used as a supplement and 1% feed B used as a supplement. This isn't really a rocket science conclusion, but it's uh, just a demonstration of the approach we take in, in designing these media. And this is in the verification of, of that uh, run in, uh, again, letting the uh, uh, reactor run uh, uncontrolled in cell density at one reactor volume exchange per day. And in this case, we got 75 million viable cells per mil. So we see the formulation is more optimized. Uh, here's some other parameters uh, being measured, monitored. Um, uh, again, this is a viable cell in this graph and, and, and over here to compare the other values. The um, specific productivity uh, maintained at 30 picograms per cell per day, uh, here uh, plotted here, um, showing a very nice uh, uh, equilibrium state was established. And then this is confirmation uh, holding the reactor at 50 million viable cells per mil. Remember, it was 40 million for the media that was optimized using the batch approach. Here we have 50 million viable cells per mil, one reactor volume per day, and uh, a one week uh, steady state established, uh, demonstrating the, um, the power of that um, optimized formulation. So my second case study, this is the first study was in, as you recall, a uh, monoclonal antibody being produced in a, Cho cell, in a Cho cell line, a proprietary borrowed line. And, um, we worked both the batch approach and the steady state approach to uh, working with the media, with uh, our, our, our commercially available media and feeds. Here we're looking at T cells in, in a uh, perfusion in the same um, bioreactor. Uh, we're going to compare batch and perfusion results uh, using a, uh, uh, an immortalized T cell. So uh, we're expanding the cells in T225 flasks. We're using the CD3 and CD28 beads to uh, keep the uh, T cells going. Um, we're kept at uh, 5 times 10 to the 8 cells per mil uh, using the 2 liter cell bag. Uh, and perfusion was initiated at uh, 2 million cells per mil. And continued up through uh, 2 times 10 to the 10th uh, cells per mil, as, as I'll show you. So here we see um, the result of uh, changing the perfusion rate to uh, one reactor volume per day. These brackets here show where the, the duration of the uh, adjustment is, and then comparing um, uh, the culture without perfusion to culture with perfusion, showing that the culture does respond, uh, giving a significantly higher uh, cell density, uh, as you'd expect. And uh, here looking at cell viability in without the perfusion and with the perfusion over the same uh, adjusted, these, these, this is the same run, uh, the plotting different uh, values for it. And here's looking at some lactate, ammonia, glucose, and IL-2 over the same period with the same um, adjustments of, um, of uh, perfusion. I'm sorry, so I, I should say here, uh, the, the conclusion then is that 
we can do the same thing with a T cell culture uh, uh, approaching in, a, in our cell bag perfusion um, reactor uh, and optimize, examine, and get uh, significantly improved results. Where this will lead to, what the maximum, what an optimal situation is, uh, is not uh, reflected here, but it certainly shows that we can work with it and begin to approach perfusion culture of uh, T cells, even with uh, exogenous uh, growth factor stimulation. And then one more point on working this way, uh, it was noticed that we can, um, in measuring some of the uh, pr uh, parameters of, of product quality here, looking at the MAB quality, it was noticed that we can actually affect and kind of tune the product quality based on uh, perfusion rate as well as cell density. So obviously these could be competing uh, uh, goals at times, but uh, by adjusting the perfusion rate and, cell and peak cell density, uh, given the limitations in the mass flow of our particular reactor, um, we, we can examine and control or goal, have a goal of um, product quality by a few different uh, parameters as well as cell density. So uh, using this one model uh, reactor, some commercial, commercially available um, media and feeds, uh, we show that we can get some pretty dramatic uh, results in uh, perfusion culture in both uh, uh, eukaryotic uh, MAB producing recombinants and uh, T cells. And um, we're looking forward to applying this type of technology with the larger XDR bioreactors, stirred tank, uh, that, that go up to 2,000 liters, with other uh, equipment uh, uh, affording perfusion capability. So that's what I've got today. Uh, if, if we have any questions, I've, we certainly have the time. And uh, it's, this has been my field for the, um, for the past many years. Uh, so any questions on media formulation, the new drive towards continuous processing, or what's going on in perfusion um, bioreactors, um, I'm, I'd be happy to, to discuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was wondering, when you, um, when you plotted the, the actual yields of the product, the monoclonal antibody, mm -hmm. That's an interesting dynamic. Um, the parameters are when you exchange primary metabolites for the most part in most reactors, including ours, you're exchanging um, product. So as you pull out uh, spent media, you're removing product as well. So the, you've got you know, many rates going on. You're consuming primary metabolites. You're, you're uh, uh, accumulating secondary metabolites. You're accumulating product. When you harvest um, material for uh, to reduce the cell count. In our case, uh, you're, you're you're taking a concomitant volume of media. Other people, if you're using something like the ATF Refine, you can vary this. You can, or if you're using a, a KSEP centrifuge, you can take a slurry of cells. So you can disproportionately harvest cells as opposed to the ambient media containing metabolites and product. Uh, that's variable. Uh, so, so there are many, um, many factors here, many rates that can be examined. And as I already introduced, uh, viable cell count is one monitor of what's in the reactor in terms of cell mass, uh, but, but their diameter, their, their net diameter and then mass is another way of looking at it. So we have these multiple uh, graphs that, that, that you know, we play with in, uh, in, in development. And they're all interesting, and they reveal sometimes startling things because we, we're so used to working in batch culture for the past 20 years that we become kind of mentally lazy and make these assumptions like that, that, that two cultures at the same cell density by count are the same, which is not true at all in, in perfusion. Uh, and many other, um, as I introduced on the, qual on the product quality graph, that we uh, tend to excite even um, pathways we haven't seen before when we're operating at 100 million cells per mil because they're under stresses that they weren't under before. They're not only under mass transfer stress, primary metabolite stress, or accumulation of waste, but they're at different rates and different concentrations than we ever saw in uh, batch. And there are effects that, that uh, aren't really understood yet. For example, it's been observed that in many um, packed bed reactors, 
that we can do without a lot of the growth factors that uh, are required under a lower density culture. And uh, whether these are because of autocrine effects or whether there is a uh, cell contact effect that spares for a, a growth factor or whatever, we don't know. But, uh, but that's been, it was kind of noticed accidentally that uh, people were operating these high densities and they'd say, oh, gee, we, we realize we're not adding the proportional amount of growth factor, uh, but the cultures are doing well. So uh, many factors involved. And the only way to really tease it out is through actual experimentation. You can predict a bit, you can model it a bit, but because we're discovering new phenomena, you have to actually do it. And that's, that's the state we're at now. Uh, people like Genzyme are really forging the way. There are many individual uh, universities, uh, private companies, and consortiums that are promoting continuous manufacturing, and upstream that's for the most part perfusion. Uh, but even in perfusion, uh, there are many different approaches. There's packed bed, there's stirred tank, there's the, the wave, there's um, uh, hollow fiber bioreactors. There are many approaches to getting a continuous uh, uh, culture set up, each one having a little bit different ratio of product uh, concentration and accumulation, um, uh, primary, secondary metabolites, and mass transfer. One other point on that is, for example, in a packed bed or in a hollow fiber bioreactor, because of the diameter, the, the porosity of the fibers, uh, you accumulate product exquisitely on the uh, one side of the fiber uh, and have free flowing uh, metabolites. So you can harvest uh, disproportionately your, your product with cells and, and cell debris, but independently of primary, secondary metabolites, which is kind of unique in these uh, perfusion reactors. And do you take aeration into account to decrease um, offspring? Aeration? Yeah, that, that's what I'm referring to when I say mass transfer. Um, uh, and, and yes, and there's a new dynamic setup. We already know, for example, in sparging, it was mostly discovered empirically that small bubbles are good for oxygen because of the um, uh, relative uh, solubility of oxygen, and that larger bubbles are better for, for, for washing out um, CO2. But then we're working in a, in a um, perfusion bioreactor. We have you know, added pressures and rates and, and demands. The reactors have been tweaked to support high density, high peak cell densities um, in the, our standard media uh, of, of about 10 million cells per mil. But when working in perfusion, uh, obviously the, the demand for oxygen is, is much higher. But yet, you know, the, the uh, rate of accumulation of CO2 changes dramatically. So the ratio of oxygen demand to CO2 accumulation changes dramatically. And we have to just uh, empirically determine what the cultures uh, desire in those conditions. There was another question. Yes, uh, you mentioned bad experiments for your first mm -hmm. Uh, we saw that in, uh, it's a very astute question. You might ask, why would optimization of a media in batch um, translate to an improvement in perfusion? And if that's true, why didn't we improve the media for batch culture? And there are a few answers to that question. Um, one being that uh, media are designed, the, the basic formulation are designed for things other than maximal peak growth. Well, one is robustness of seeding, low seeding densities. You can choke cultures. If it's a very, uh, a very rich media, they cannot seed well. Um, storage and shipping and, and, uh, um, and stability over time is another parameter. There are maybe 30 parameters that have to be considered in designing a media besides supporting peak cell density. Um, but yeah, so we, uh, I think the, the results were we, we, we operated at 40 million based on that formulation that, that the batch culture optimization uh, came out for the, for the eukaryotic cell line, the, the non-T cell, I think it's, it's CHO or hybridome, I think it's CHO. Um, uh, we operated at 40 million cells per mil and then the formulation that was developed uh, using the steady state approach using actual perfusion reactions um, uh, operated at 50 million. Uh, viable cells per mil. So it, the, the uh, uh, perfusion approach 
uh, was more efficient, as you'd expect, because it reflected the, the actual condition. The reason why we advocate the batch was that it did give a significant improvement, and it's a lot faster, especially using DOE and micro tighter plates and, and flasks. Uh, it's much easier, much faster, and it gave some, uh, some benefit. In all of this work, uh, it's important to keep a particular goal and your, your particular goals in mind. Uh, I've worked in R&D for a long time, and, and um, we would often get carried away with particular, with, with, with goals of tighter or viability or longevity or whatever it might be, or economy in the media, uh, but these are all determined by uh, the, the, the market forces and the particular uh, goals of the, um, of the project. When you're working in small scale, often you don't care about the cost of the media so much. Uh, if, you're, if you're actually moving into bio, biopharmaceutical production, the cost becomes more of a factor, things like that. So uh, you can you know, rapidly uh, get some significant benefit in a batch approach to uh, perfusion media, but it was the perf perfusion work that actually gave the, probably pretty much the optimum for those components, the Actacho with the feeds. The next step would be uh, to work on a proprietary media for uh, perfusion culture, not from a commercially available source, but, but uh, de novo formulation, which uh, we, you can see because we are operating at 50 million cells per mil, and I've already told you that many people are operating at 100 million cells per mil that, uh, that original formulations and uh, more efficient uh, reactors, perfusion mechanisms can drive it much higher. Yes? Yeah, um, I, I touched on that briefly here. We're, we did we do look at um, acidic variants, alkaline variants, the aggregation, um, some glycosylation. In this particular study, now we, we do much more. We do a whole panel of protein quality, that is, you know, characteristics um, for for a variety of research uh, approaches. This is a little fingerprint here, and the the intent of this is to looking at the perfusion rate in picoliters per cell per day, and there's a lot of ways of measuring your, these rates. This is picoliters of media exchanged per cell per day, and what the consequences on some of these um, parameters of product quality were. So, uh, uh, yeah, the, the goal at the end is economy, speed, robustness, um, product quality, um, total mass, and, and then evolving into, into other goals, such as flexibility of process. Uh, many experienced companies are getting so proficient at this that not only they say, okay, we've got a lot of product, it's high quality, it's inexpensive, but we want to set up uh, facilities around the world. And we want to set up a facility in Singapore and in, in, uh, Soviet, in Russia. Um, and we want it to be reproducible and, and fast. So they want a modular, uh, uh, flexible, reproducible, single-use facility that they can just, you know, plug in or, or ship over and, and institute rapidly, and that can be operated with various levels of technical expertise. So these goals keep piling on. It's yes, but. Oh, yes, we have that. Now we want something more. Uh, and this is what's happening in continuous manufacturing as well, including now, I mean, the, the goal not only the, for, the, for the savvy companies, the people who are experienced, uh, operating uh, perfusion at 100 million cells per mil and, and having a continuous uh, manufacturing upstream is done. They're doing it, companies like Genzyme. They're working on downstream, and that's coming along now too with simulated moving bed columns and higher technology for continuous, even capture uh, columns. Yes. Uh, companies like uh, Replogen now, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Tarpon Biosystems was... Um, recently purchased uh, by Paul, and they uh, are, are affecting a single-use, continuous, downstream, simulated moving bed uh, column apparatus. Um, so okay, so, so they're putting this together, but now the goal is to say, oh, that's great, but what we want now is enterprise control. We want uh, a cloud-based control so that we can see what materials are required, keep this whole thing going so that we can, you know, sit on the beach in Florida and kind of make sure that everything's in place and, and operating. I mean, I'm exaggerating there, but no, but true enterprise control of the whole system rather than individual unit operations so that they're linked. 
Because they are now more physically linked, there are fewer breaks, uh, fewer storage in between unit operations. So they, they we're looking at uh, uh, control systems that uh, will, will handle this. And certainly the computing power and algorithms exist. It's a matter of practically getting it in one, uh, in one package. Thank you.